Well, welcome to the Truth and Precept channel. In this presentation, I'm going to be covering Isaiah chapter 48, which is also 1 Nephi chapter 20, which is the version I'm going to be using. Now, this is an incredibly important chapter for us. It is the first chapter that is contained in the Book of Mormon uh, from Isaiah. And we know that nearly a third of the Book of Isaiah is in the Book of Mormon. It is critical to understand Isaiah, to understand the end time prophecies. Otherwise, there's a good chance we're not going to be prepared for what's coming. Now, it's interesting that Nephi started his introduction to Isaiah with chapter 48 instead of chapter 1 of Isaiah. And I think that is especially pertinent, the message he is trying to deliver to us as members of the church. And he's telling us, as a quick summary, be prepared to hear some different things, some new things. Things are, are different than what you might think or what you've been told. And so don't, you know, don't go getting angry because this is prophesied. Right? This is supposed to happen. So this is going to be, hopefully, you know, a eye-widening chapter for for all of us about what Nephi wanted us to understand. And so let's get started here. Now. I've now this is I'm taking this approach where I've already pre-written and coded my notes here for us to review for this chapter 20 of First Nephi, and so it looks like a mess right now, but I'll break it down, and we're really going to start to see how incredible Isaiah's words are. Nephi loved Isaiah's words. Right. And Christ, he quoted Isaiah often, and truly we will see that Isaiah's words are great. And so the context for this, right at the end of chapter 20 of verse of First Nephi, Nephi gives us instructions right at the very end of that chapter about how to understand the true meaning of Isaiah, and and as in addition, you know, all scripture, really. And it is that we must apply the scriptures to us. Right? He says we, got, we, ha we have to liken them. And then we'll develop eyes to see the prophecies. That is when the prophecies contained in the scriptures really unfold is when we start applying them to ourselves. And then and it, additionally, as I try to you know, include in every Isaiah video, Christ tells us in 3 Nephi chapter 23, 1 through 3, that all Isaiah's words would be fulfilled again among the latter-day Gentiles. So what happened to ancient Israel in like will happen to us. Right, so the way I've coded this here is I've made... I've highlighted the words that are tied together so that you can see clearly who is the person being talked about. Right, and then I'll have my notes and I have some other legends along the side and there's a few a couple chiasmus in here as well. And so let's start here verse 1. Hearken and hear this, O house of Jacob. Who's he talking to? Who are called by the name of Israel and are come forth out of the waters of Judah or out of the waters of baptism okay so this so far is a group of people who are engaging in water baptism continuing who swear which is also another word for making an oath or a covenant 
right, who, who make a covenant, who swear by the name of the Lord, they are making, this people are making covenants in the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, right? Mention seems like almost in passing, not very deep, like, and I, and I would say kind of like a milk level, right? They talk about God on the on a very surface level. They just make mention, right? And that kind of reminds me of, right, of the other scriptures that say, right, people speaking uh, about God with their lips, but not really with their hearts. It's not very deep. Yet, they, these covenant, these covenant people, swear or make oaths or covenant. They make co so they swear not in truth. They're making covenants not in truth. So is this a false covenant? If it's not truth, it's the opposite, right? Nor in righteousness. Let me read that again. Right? Yet they swear not in truth nor in righteousness. The covenants they are making right, are not done, right? They're false covenants. And they're done in wickedness, right? Not in truth, right? And so where have we seen this? Well, we've seen this in, you know, in Helaman chapter 1. Let me get my scriptures here. Helaman chapter 1, verse 11. And it says, And he went unto those that sent him. And they all entered into a covenant. Now this is Gadiad to robbers, secret combinations. Yea, what did they do? Swearing by their everlasting maker that they would tell no man that Kishkumen had murdered Pahoran. Okay, so they are swearing by the everlasting maker. They're swearing by the name of the Lord in doing things that were evil. Okay, and then we have Helaman chapter 6, verse 22. And it came to pass that they did have their signs, yea, their secret signs and their secret words, and this that they might distinguish a brother who had entered into the covenant, that whatsoever wickedness his brother should do, he should not be injured by his brother, nor by those who did belong to his band, who had taken this covenant. And verse 38. And it came to pass, on the other hand, that the Nephites did build them up. This is the Gadianta robbers, secret combinations. The Nephites built them up and, and support them, beginning at the more wicked part of them, until they had overspread all the land of the Nephites and had seduced the more part of the righteous, until they had come down to believe in their works. So they convinced the, the righteous, they had seduced them, to enter into their covenant, right? To partake of this wickedness. This, these are wicked covenants. Okay, and then the, and then Moses, chapter five, verse two. Uh, well, that, actually, that's not verse two. Let's see. I just wrote that one. Let's see here, verse twenty-nine. And Satan said unto me, Cain. Swear unto me by thy throat, and if thou tell it, thou shalt die, and swear thy brethren by their heads, and by, and by the living God, that they tell it not. Right? So they're making these secret covenants, and they're doing it in the name of the Lord. So that's where we have seen this. These are the examples that we are given as a pattern in the scriptures. So the question, this is the big question, right? who is this? Who is Nephi talking to? Right? Who are we to understand? Is this us? 
Are we doing water baptisms? Are we making covenants by the name of the Lord? Are we making mention of God? And yet, it says, the way God sees it is these covenants are not in truth nor in righteousness. Right? Is that a surprise? Right? This is why Nephi put this chapter in here. Very first chapter in of Isaiah, chapter 48. He skipped right to this one. Right? You know, right in first Nephi. Right? This is to hit us hard. This should be making us double think about what we have believed what we have been told because the scriptures are telling us something different. Right? Jesus Christ said, Isaiah's words applied to the Latter-day Gentiles. Are we not the covenant people? Verse 2, Nevertheless, they, and I'll just say, instead of house of Israel, I'm just going to say Israel for short, they, Israel, call themselves of the holy city. So these people say they are Israel. They say the holy city right, is Zion. So they say that they are Zion. But they, Israel, do not stay themselves upon the God, upon the God of Israel. So instead of staying rather in the straight and narrow path, right, they have they have strayed off of that. Right? They do not stay on that path to God. Right? And upon the God of Israel who is the Lord of hosts, yea, the Lord of hosts is his names. Right? And I, and I would include exclamation. That's three times that Isaiah is telling us who God is and his name. What well why? Why three times special number? So if we go over to Isaiah chapter one, verse three, right? The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Right? He says, you know, all these other animals they know who God is, but Israel, my people, they don't really know me. Verse 3, Behold, I have declared the former things. Now, this, these are prophecies. He's declared these prophecies from the beginning. What is happening now was prophesied thousands of years ago. And they went, and they, the prophecies, went forth out of my mouth. And I showed it them. Now, this is speaking he showed the ancient Israelites these prophecies, and I did show them suddenly. Right? They were fulfilled in one instance. Right? The prophecies did happen of Isaiah. But as we're told from Jesus Christ, they're going to happen again. But it's taken a lot longer. Right? They have, those prophecies were fulfilled thousands of years ago. Right? And so... In essence, long ago, I told you what was going to happen and even had those events play out anciently as an example of what to expect. These are types and shadows. These are, right, these are parables. This is how God, you know, God prophesies in this way because of our fallen state. His the history becomes his way of telling parables. Right? He loves telling us in parables. And I did it because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is in an iron sinew, and thy brow brass. Right? So parables right, help shield the teachings from those who will not accept them. Um, you know, like in Joseph Smith's day, people had problems when he declared that God had a body. People couldn't handle it. Verse 5, And I have even from the beginning declared 
these prophecies to the to Israel before it came to pass I showed them thee and I showed them for fear lest thou shalt should say my idol has done them now let's pause idol who would be an idol to the covenant people who they look to for prophecy right? this is what we're talking we're not talking about movie stars and basketball players as idols we're talking about the covenant people's idols in the context is we're talking about these prophecies and, and we know Israel's not in a good state right, in the last days right? the covenant people and so who who would this be who, who is the idol of the covenant people? And continuing, and my graven image, right? I would think of those as our TVs, computers, media, news. And my molten image hath commanded them. So molten image, that, that word molten really, you know, if we draws our minds back to Exodus chapter 32, when the children of Israel made a golden calf. Right? They, they molted the metal. And so what does that mean, right? That, that was, they were worshiping, they were obeying something other than God. Right? So, you know, let's think about who, you know, who other than God are we worshiping? Are we obeying? Are we obeying their commands? And so these prophecies about what has been and is, is go and is going to happen in the last days are in the scriptures. Right? That's why Jesus Christ told us in, in uh, J Joseph Smith, Matthew 1, verse 39, right, that we must treasure up these his words so we're not deceived. But we have not understood their meaning. We have not understood the scriptures in the way that they're meant to be understood. We haven't likened them to ourselves. So let's go over to Isaiah 44, verses 7 through 8. And actually, I'm going to read the Isaiah Institute version here. because It's put together really well. And it says, who predicts what happens as do I and is equal of me in appointing a people from of old as types for telling things to come? So he's just saying, I use things that happened of old as types to foretell things to come. Be not perturbed or shaken. Right, this is going to be perhaps a new idea for you. Have I not made it known to you from of old? Did I not foretell it, you being my witnesses? Is there a God then apart from me? There is no rock unknown to me. Just continually you know, driving this point home. Right? That history is sets a precedence, a type of what he is foretelling, what he is prophesying will happen in the future. Verse six, thou, being Israel, hast seen and heard all this, and will ye not declare them? Now I've, I've circled the, the, you know, the synonyms here, or pronouns for Israel to call out this is a subset within, right? and I have it down here. This is a remnant that survives. This applies more to them, and that will become clearer. And so as we think about this, you know, saying basically the elect is, is who that remnant is. Right? The elect has seen and heard all this, and will you not declare them? 
question mark and that I have showed you these these new things from this time even hidden things and thou didst not know them right now that is actually that point there right that as a chiasmus point that you know that focal point this main message is is telling us you know recognize that you are going to hear new things that have been there the whole time. This is an important point for us to understand. Right? And so even though God has revealed the whole vision in Isaiah to us, you know, the rest, all of us have not known it and we haven't taught it. And these events are going to play out again. And so we, as our eyes are opened, as we apply them to ourselves, we're going to see all these things that have been there the whole time hid, hidden in plain sight, as, as the saying goes. Verse 7, they, meaning these prophecies, are created now, not from the beginning, even before the day when thou heardest them. Not they were declared unto thee, lest thou should say, Behold, I knew them. So the events are happening now, the prophecies weren't just for the past, but they have been there since the beginning, and you don't know them, right? So none of the Lord's people, you know, none of their idols, etc., their news, right? Whatever other, you know, images they may be looking towards, none of them know the whole vision as revealed in the Scripture. They won't be able to say they knew them. And so who is saying this, right? right? He's warning, you know, that you're not going to be able to say, I knew them. They're not going to come through your idols. Verse 8, Yea, and thou heardest not, yea, thou knewest not, Yea, from that time thine ear was not opened. For I knew that thou would deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. Meaning, you you were born into apostasy from God. If you if that is a new idea to you, I'd recommend watching my, Mel, my Melchizedek Priesthood video to understand why or how we have been born into apostasy. And so it was prophesied that when the right time would come, some would begin to understand the words of Isaiah. And so we have a cross-reference here in Second Nephi, chapter 25, verse 7. But behold, I proceed with, and this is Nephi, I proceed with my own prophecy according to my plainness in which I know that no man can err. Nevertheless, in the days that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, men shall know of a surety at the times when they shall come to pass. Right. So we're going to under, start understanding and we are understanding how Isaiah's words are being fulfilled. Right? Right? We haven't had the ears to hear. Right? God knew that, that Israel, the covenant people, would betray and change his words to mean something other than what they, would, what they meant. And that was proven. Right? So if we look at Mormon chapter 8, Verse 33, where Moroni right, really comes after us of the Gentiles of the Church of God in the last days. And he says in verse 33, O ye wicked and ye perverse and stiff-necked people, why have you built churches unto yourselves to get gain? I've seen that. Why have ye transfigured the holy word of God? He's telling us we've changed 
the word of God. Right? How? Well, we can find things in the scriptures that contradict what the church is teaching now. That ye, may, that ye might bring damnation upon your souls. Behold, look ye unto the revelations of God, which are found in the scriptures. For behold, the time cometh at that day when all these things must be fulfilled. Right? Right? They're always pointing us back to the scriptures. Jesus Christ did too. You, know, you need to search Isaiah diligently. Right? So you're not deceived. Look at the revelations that have been given, right? Because you've transfigured, you've changed the word, right? In Isaiah 24, 5, I won't read that one, but that's a prophecy telling us, and it's also found in Doctrine and Covenants, section 1, verse 15, that we have changed, that we've broken, we've changed the ordinances and broken the everlasting covenant. This is what we've done. Nevertheless, for my name's sake, will I defer my anger, and for my praise will I refrain from thee. And this is the elect, the remnant that will survive, that I cut thee not off. And then we get another chiasmus here. For behold, I have refined thee, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Okay, so how does one become chosen? Right? Well, it's when you are facing the heat, right? the great tribulation that's prophesied in, in the book of Revelation. Right? It's when you're facing that heat, that is the time to make an offering to God. In 3 Nephi 9, chapter 20, right? Christ says, no more sacrifices of blood, or your sacrifice now is going to be the offering of a broken heart and contrite spirit. That's your offering, right? And so let's also look, you know, in John, the Revelator tells us, chapter 7, verse 14, right, that those who come out of the great tribulation, right, they're the ones, right, who are wearing the white robes, who have washed themselves, in the blood of the Lamb, they've repented. They've applied his atonement. Well, if we look at Malachi, chapter 3, last book in the Old Testament, and verses 1 through 4, right, Behold, I will send my messenger, this is the end-time servant, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. This is the second coming. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. This is the offering of a broken heart and contrite spirit. Verse 4, And then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. Right? So this is the righteous covenant, which is the real everlasting covenant or, or perpetual covenant that we should be making instead of the covenants that we have been making with the secret combinations that we were accused of in verse 1. And so the reason we go through you know, affliction, through suffering, through the furnace, right? is to break us down, right? Break down our walls that are around our hearts, around our minds, so that when we get to this humbled state, this low point, which is by design, that's what it's supposed to do, what we then do 
is critical at that point. Right? Will we soften our, our hearts right? and make the offering of a broken heart and contrite spirit to God? Or do we harden and curse God? We must learn in our suffering where the moment is lost. And you, you may have to continue to suffer until you get that right. Verse 11, For my own sake, yea, for my own sake will I do this. For I will not suffer my name to be polluted, and I will not give my glory unto another. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. So he's going back to the rest of the house of Israel, right, which, I, which, I don't, which is why I don't have it circled in green. And he's calling them my called. Right? All of us had been called. Right? But how are you chosen? Going back up to verse 10, right? It's going through that, through that affliction, that suffering, and making that offering. So that's how you get chosen. And that's what's supposed to happen during the Great Tribulation. And so you see that here, I have the chiasmus in orange here for, for the words called and sake, so you can see that visually. Okay. Uh, verse 13. Mine hand hath also laid the foundation of the earth. So what I like to do is look at the first reference often, you know, applicable reference to a key word to help me find kind of a deeper meaning, you know, or of expanding, you know, what we can understand about this, this callback, right? So if we look at the word foundation, first used in Exodus chapter 9, verse 18, and it's about the plagues of Egypt, which is the time of Moses, who is a representation of the end time servant. And so this mine hand, you know, is that person, right, that we should expect. Okay. And my right hand hath spanned or stretched the heavens. So, you know, keep going here. I call unto them, and they stand up together. So there's two hands here. It's calling them them. Right? The two hands are two servants. So one of them right, is the new Moses, which I have a whole series I'm doing on that. If you want more information. But then the other one, right, it said he stretched the heavens. Right? Now as we understand through the rest of Isaiah, right, that is going to be a modern representation of the ancient king of Assyria. So let's read a little bit about him in Isaiah chapter fourteen, verse eleven through fifteen. Now, we've often, in the church at least, associated that this is Satan. And that may be so, but this also applies to the king of Syria. And that's generally who I would say that it primarily refers to. So your glory, in verse 11, your glory has been, this is talking about this evil hand, right? this king of Assyria. Your glory has been cast down to Sheol, or hell, along with the music of your lyres. Beneath you is a bed of maggots. You are covered with worms. It's not very kind words for him, but that's the type of person he is. How you have fallen from the heavens. So, you know, this idea of the right hand, right? He stretched the heavens, right? You can only fall, really, right, when you have ascended, right? And so, you know, similarly to Satan, right? This fallen servant must have been someone who was high up, who had ascended spiritually. Um, 
how you have fallen from the heavens, O morning star, son of the dawn, who, you who commanded the nations, have been hewn down to earth. You said in your heart, I will rise in the heavens, and I will set up my throne above the stars of God. I will seat myself in the mount of assembly of the gods, in the utmost heights, or Zaphon. I will ascend above the altitude of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you have been brought down to hell, to the utmost depths of the pit. Um, what's interesting, most high, there in verse 14, in Hebrew is El Elyon, which kind of, you know, I don't think this is correct, but it kind of reminded me of Elon, and who's building rockets, and, you know, I don't think he is the king of Assyria, but perhaps the king of Assyria is using, or will use, what uh, Elon has created, right? And so this, this king of Assyria, he says, right, you said in your heart, I will rise in the heavens, I will set my throne above the stars of God, I will ascend Right, you think about like a rocket. I will ascend above the altitude of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. So you could possibly see in our modern day, right, uh, this evil ruler, you know, launching himself up into space to watch the destruction that he is causing to be had on the earth. And Let's see here, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 4 through 5. Without me thou shalt bow down under the prisoners, and they shall fall under the slain, for all his anger is not turned away, but his hand right, is stretched out still. O Assyrian, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hand is my indignation. So this is presenting us, introducing us, here in this first uh, instance of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, to the two servants, right? the one who will punish and the one who will deliver by the power of God. And let's see, verse 14. All ye, now this is the elect, assemble yourselves and hear who among the elect, them, hath declared these things unto them, Right, that's a call back to verse 6. He's asking, who among the elect has declared these things to them, to the rest of Israel, you know, to the rest of the covenant people? Right. So if we go back up to verse 6, right, where he's talking about the elect, right? you elect, you have seen and heard all this, and will you not declare them? Right? That tie back, declare, declare the prophecies, declare these things. Right? The Lord hath loved him. Okay. So, you know, it is our duty to warn our neighbor about, quote unquote, these things, these prophecies that we have not likened, right? That we can now see with new eyes. It is our responsibility, right? And if we remain silent, right? Right? Just like the watchmen, right? If they don't warn, the blood is on their hands, right? And so, you know, you don't have to make videos. You know, this is my way of declaring these things. But each of us needs to take up this responsibility. You know, you can share this, but... but you, you know, you can go write posts, you know, on social media, share memes that include these things or, you know, whatever you, you know, whatever your talents, strengths are, you know, you need to declare these things if you want to be the elect. You can't just sit back and remain silent. Okay? That's not part of being someone who wants to be the elect. And you're going to you know, and, I, and I'll testify to this, that as you do that, you will enter into a furnace of affliction. 
because there will be many who will start persecuting you. You can expect that. Right? They will speak evil of your name, but that's all part of the design, the process to make you chosen. You need to go through that. And the Lord loves those who declare his words. Right? Continuing, and he will fulfill his word, which he hath declared by them. And he will do his pleasure on Babylon and his arm. Now these are, as you can see here, these are all referencing the end time servants, one or both in these cases. And his arm shall come upon the Chaldeans or Babylonians. So destruction as declared is coming upon all of Babylon. You're not going to be able to stay safe in your bunker. You have to you have to leave. You have to go to Zion to find peace. Verse 15. Also saith the Lord, I the Lord, yea, I have spoken, yea, I have called him to declare. Right. The Lord says, I have called him, this new Moses, to declare, right, to declare these prophecies. I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. Right, The end time servant is not going to fail. Verse 16, come ye near unto me. Right, The Lord, when he uses the word come, he's meaning make a covenant with me. Right, What covenant? Well, the covenant that you make as you enter, as you make the offering of broken heart, contrite spirit. I have not spoken in secret. This is that tie back to verse 1. Right? The covenants we have made in secret right, with our brethren in the Lord's name are not his. They are from secret combinations. This is how we discern between good and evil. Right? If somebody is keeping something in secret... Right, that should be that should start raising our eyebrows, because that's not how the Lord works. He wants us to know His things, you know, as ready as we are to receive them. We do not need to enter into secret oaths with each other. It's not the Lord's way. So I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it, these prophecies was declared have I spoken it all these prophecies are wide open in the scriptures they've been there the whole time they're not secret right now you haven't had the eyes to understand them because of your fallen state right? but this has all been declared publicly in millions of copies of the Bible and the Lord God and his spirit hath sent me Verse 17, and thus says the Lord, this is the end time servant speaking, he's saying, thus saith the Lord, it's refreshing to hear, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I, right, I have sent him, and the Lord thy God, who teacheth thee to profit, who leadeth thee by the way thou shouldst go, hath done it. So we get this, this just amazing concept of right that's being driven home with these chiasmus around this word sent right he's the servant says the lord sent me and the lord says i have sent him kind of echoing back now why is that important right, because most people are not going to see it that way because of the things he's going to say and do And it's going to go against their traditions, right? The, the the things they've believed in that are the precepts of men. And so it's through the prophecies that the end time servant. It's through the prophecies and the end time servant 
that the Lord will guide us through these times. Right? He will lead us by the way that we should go. And he's, he's declared it through these prophecies and announced an end time servant. Verse 18, Oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments. Right? Most of us are not following the Lord's commands. You know, and in part, you know, we need to declare these things. Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Right? So those who are, you know, are left who don't recognize the end time servant from is from the Lord, will not have peace. They will not have righteousness. You know, they won't have posterity. They won't be able to escape Babylon when it comes tumbling down. Thy seed has also been as the sand, the offspring of thy bowels, like the gravel thereof. His name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Go ye forth of Babylon. Flee ye from the Chaldeans. With a voice of singing declare ye, Tell this, right? tell these, now this is the elect, right? He's, he's saying, get out of Babylon, flee, right? declare this. What's this? It's these prophecies. Utter to the end of the earth and say, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. Right? We need to, when we identify who this end time servant is, when he comes, we need to, it says, say, tell people about it. But the Lord now has a real true prophet. You know, one that we've not had since the days of Joseph Smith. And let's read actually this here. So let's go as cross references. We'll go to Second Nephi chapter three. And we'll start verse 10. And Moses will I raise up to deliver thy people out of the land of Egypt. Verse 16 through 18. Yea, thus prophesied Joseph, I am sure of this thing, even as I am sure of the promise of Moses. For the Lord hath said unto me, I will preserve thy seed forever. And the Lord hath said, I will raise up a Moses. And I will give power unto him in a rod. And I will give judgment unto him in writing. Yet I will not loose his tongue that he shall speak much, for I will not make him mighty in speaking. And on it goes. I did a whole video on Second Nephi chapter 3, where I really break this down. So I won't go into that anymore. But the other reference in Doctrine and Covenants, section 103, verse 15 through 18. Behold, I say unto you, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. This hasn't happened yet. This is still in the future. Therefore I will raise up unto my people a man who shall lead them like as Moses led the children of Israel. That's why he's called the new Moses. And he's going to lead us on an exodus. For ye are the children of Israel. He's telling us, right? And of the seed of Abraham, and ye must needs be led out of bondage by power. We're going to be in bondage. And with a stretched out arm. And as your fathers were led at the first, even so shall the redemption of Zion be. Just a few quick cross references about the new Moses who will lead us on an exodus. And that leads us right into verse 21. And they thirsted not. He led them. Right? As we follow that line back up to verse 17. Right? Who leadeth thee by the way. Right? We read in other scriptures right, that a highway will be made, a holy highway that will lead to Zion. And this is one of his responsibilities. Right? So the elect will not thirst. This is important. They're not going to thirst because we have been thirsting spiritually. And he and he'll lead us. The sentence servant will lead us. These the elect. Through the deserts, 
he caused the waters to flow out of the rock. So as we draw our minds back to these key words, right, these synonyms, you know, as we look at John chapter 4, verse 14, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Right? We just read that they thirsted not. Just a few words before. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay, and then over in D&C 63, verse 23. But unto him that keepeth my commandments. Right? Because, what did we read up here? Verse 18, oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments. Right? The majority of Israel is not doing that. Okay. But unto him that keepeth my commandments. This is the elect. The elect this group of people who we are talking about. I will give the mysteries of my kingdom. And the same shall be in him, a well of living water springing up unto everlasting life. Right? And so the servant, he caused, right? the servant will cause the living water. And so this will be the fullness of the gospel. It will be the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He's going to cause those things to flow out of the rock. What is the rock? The rock is Christ. It can also be revelation that comes from Christ. And so the servant is going to bring the fullness of the gospel, the mysteries of the kingdom of God to the elect on the Exodus. He's led them out through the deserts already. He's going to do this by revelation from Christ. For them, so he's going to do that for them, for the elect. He, the end time servant, clave the rock also and the waters gushed out. Right? So any barriers that were limiting the flow of revelation will be unobstructed. Christ will hold nothing back. Right? It will be gushing out. And notwithstanding, he, the end time servant, hath done all this. All this meaning he's, he's revealed the fullness of the gospel again, brought revelations, right? And greater also, right? Referencing, right? That, that barrier, right? Where Christ will hold nothing back. Right? There's going to be so much. You know, this is probably when we get the sealed plates. It will be for those on the Exodus. They're not going to be revealed to the rest of Israel who can't even keep the commandments, who are making secret, who are, who are making oaths and covenants with the secret combinations. They're not going to get these greater things. And notwithstanding, he hath done all this and greater also. There is no peace. Right? Drawing us all the way back up here. Right? There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Right? So this peace ties us back up to those who are the, of the covenant people who are not keeping the Lord's commands. And then the wicked taking us back to verse 1. Right? Why does the Lord consider the house of Israel wicked in these last days? I will, you know, I'll interject there. Just what we covered, right? Brings it back full circle. This, this chapter is so pertinent, is so important to, for us as members of the church to not only understand but to believe what they're telling us here, what Isaiah is telling us, and what Nephi wanted to stress. And we need to read the rest of the Book of Mormon with this understanding, with the eyes to see. And the prophecies will start to unfold. And it is, it is a crazy thing. 
to, you know, my wife and I, we read the Book of Mormon every night. And my wife keeps saying, I feel like I'm reading this for the first time. Because you see it so differently now. You have eyes to see. And so, you know, once again, we need to, all of us, continue, as I'm trying, you know, and, you know, we're all at different levels. And so if you're in the learning level, right, start treasuring up the words, right? You can't just start declaring things, you know, if we don't know them, but we need to start somewhere and with the intention that we need to start sharing these things because we are being gathered spiritually. The elect are being gathered out, you know, out from many places, not just from Babylon, but out from wherever they are. And they need, people need to hear these things because there are many who just don't know where, you know, how's it go? The, you know, they just don't know where the truth is. That's bad paraphrasing. They can't find it. They don't know where to find it. They're finding, you know, all the kind of a, a typical anti-Mormon stuff. I would say that's, you know, a, a, that's a relative term, you know, because someone, I think the scriptures are becoming kind of anti-Mormon in a way, right? If I'm saying this is talking about the church and it's not speaking kindly of us, then I get held as an anti-Mormon. But then when I tell this stuff to anti-Mormons, they don't like me either. And so it's kind of this weird in-between place. And so, right, we have to declare these things. You know, that is, and, and people are, get so surprised, right? And and they and they and they treat you right with contemption, right, unbelief, because they've never heard these things, so they can't be true, right? My leaders have never told me these things. The manuals don't say this. Right? But that is one. Of the, that's one of the main points in the, made in the chiasmus. Right? These things have been here the whole time. Right? If it hidden in plain sight. You just haven't understood how to study them. That's why you don't know them. So, you know, as as you know, declaring these new things, these prophecies, is one of the ways that the Lord is separating the wheat from the tares, and those who will receive it with gladness, right, versus those who receive it with anger, right. That will help you identify who is who. And I'll leave this message in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.